watching the show, you're a retail investor. You see the trend, you see the writing on the wall. How would a retail investor get exposure to the upside of this? Like, what's what's the play here? I think, generally speaking, uh, Bitcoin is is a, is a good uh, index for the whole crypto industry. And generally, that's consistently continued to be the case. But for the tokenization industry, is it ETH? Is it Ethereum? Like, how do you play play this trade for it? Uh, I think they should have an interest in the real world assets themselves and think about adopting those real world assets like tokenized gold, tokenized uh, fractional ownership of real estate, tokenized carbon credits. That's, um, that's the direction I would think about. In terms of all the different technologies, I would kind of just look at the technology that's going to become indispensable to allowing all of this to operate. Generally, my uh, experience and my reading of the history of technology is that the technologies that are critical for transactions to happen, for systems to move ahead, are, are the technologies that when those transactions increase, people are in a way forced to adopt those technologies. Welcome digital asset fans. I have a special video in store for all the utility coins talked about on this channel. Huge changes to the financial system is upon us. And those that have been paying attention know that networks like the XDC network, Stellar and XRP Ledger, just to name a few, are primed to tokenize everything. Tangible assets being tokenized in a distributive ledger is a huge opportunity. And those who are invested in these technologies are about to thrive. We're going to hear from Sergey Nazarov, who says that all transactions are headed to the blockchain. Now, before I play this clip, watch it all the way through to the end because that's where it gets good. He's asked a question from host Michelle McCory on what would an investor put their money into. He first started to say Bitcoin, but then she asked him, what about the tokenization? He states the assets themselves, but also, but also the technologies that will be tokenizing the assets for payments. It's a very informative and educational clip. He's a brilliant man. He talks about smart contracts, real-world asset tokenization. He even mentions the DTCC, Euroclear, and Clearstream that are going to be leveraging these technologies for tokenization and payments. And those that have been paying attention, if you've seen my latest video, we did a deep dive and know that the technologies that are talked about on this channel are going to be doing just that. Enjoy. Just one of the many reasons I love using a decent biometric wallet is for the security. It's second to none compared to other wallets out there. You have biometric authentication, Bluetooth, and a top grade EAL5 chip. All this combined for top grade security. If you're interested in owning one of these, keep your HBAR, XRP, XLM, and other top assets safe, including Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's purchasing links in the description. I'm Michelle Mopori, and this is Kitco News, coming to you from Austin for Consensus 2024, one of the world's leading crypto, blockchain, and Web3 events. Many of the industry leaders have gathered here today, including Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink, who says eventually all transactions will be on the blockchain and that being on the blockchain will be as important and as prevalent as being on the internet. Sergey, great to have you with us. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, Sergey, we've got a lot of topics to discuss. Big focus on tokenization as well as your outlook for ETH and Bitcoin with the recent approval of the ETH spot ETF. But before we get into that, for our viewers that are not that familiar, with Chainlink, give us a brief intro and a breakdown. So Chainlink is infrastructure that allows smart contracts to operate and do advanced uh, kind of operations. It's also a set of protocols that allow the blockchain industry to function across chains and in relation to data. So in the internet, you have protocols like HTTPS, which serves uh, websites like YouTube or whatever. And you have TCP IP, over which information moves across the internet. Chainlink is a similar set of protocols and standards for how the blockchain industry works with data and connectivity across chains. And this is important because without that infrastructure, you wouldn't have the internet. And without Chainlink, you wouldn't have the growth of something called DeFi. And you wouldn't have a secure way to connect across multiple chains to form what we call the internet of contracts. So Chainlink is sometimes a little bit difficult to understand, 
because it's a low level infrastructure technology. It's kind of like the pipes of what, what makes a lot of advanced blockchain and smart co applications work. It's kind of below the surface. Right. And similarly in the internet, there's many technologies below the surface that power the internet. HTTPS, SSL, TCP IP, that's the kind of technology that Chainlink is. And you have really revolutionized the way smart contracts work with real world assets and real world data. Explain basically what that is for our viewers, the, the smart contract idea. So a smart contract is a technical agent that both parties can rely on without any trust assumptions. So when you and me do a transaction, we have trust assumptions that I will honor the transaction or that will, you will honor the transaction, or if I'm a big institution and you're a big institution, we, be, we still have assumptions that we won't renege on our, on our agreement to fulfill kind of a delivery versus payment. You buy something from me, I send it to you. Smart contracts are basically on-chain code where you can encode the conditions of our agreement right. and neither you nor me can affect those conditions. So we can have a smart contract that says, if it doesn't rain, then the prop insurance gets paid to me. <clears throat> and if it does rain, it doesn't get paid to me and you get my premium. But you, as an insurance company, would no longer have the ability to decide not to pay me, right. even if it didn't rain, because the system that is executing that agreement is outside of your control. In a traditional insurance company, that system is completely within your control. So even if it doesn't rain, you as the insurance company could choose not to pay me, then we'd have to go through a lengthy legal process. So smart contracts are basically these technical agents that operate in this infrastructure called blockchains and, and Oracle networks. And that's uh, the infrastructure that we kind of work on. Right, eliminating the trust factor condition is met. A triggers B, there's no room for confusion there. Uh, just to get that basic background for our viewers, let's now focus on what you were talking about at Consensus here. And uh, the crux of your presentation was around tokenization, saying that all transactions will eventually be on the blockchain and that we're, in fact, at a tipping point where all of the world's biggest institutions are starting to look at how they're going to put their value on chain. Echoing sentiments that we heard from Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. Earlier this year, he said um, that we believe the next step forward will be the tokenization of financial assets. And that means every stock, every bond will have its own QCIP. It'll be one general ledger. Every investor will have their own number. We would have instantaneous settlement. Now, obviously, this is going to be a huge step in revolutionizing traditional finance with blockchain with crypto. Again, as a background, explain what tokenization is before we get into why this is so momentous. Sure. So tokenization is taking the ownership rights to something like a gold bar, a piece of real estate, an equity, a commodity, really anything, and putting that ownership right into a blockchain in the smart contract we just discussed. Bitcoin is an example of an ownership right for this synthetic instrument called Bitcoin. Real world assets are an ownership right for real world things, real estate, commodities, equities, gold, and so on. And the transition that, that Mr. Fink describes is the one where the use of tokenization will no longer be limited to, we make a token about, you know, table coin. And table coin is worth whatever you and me are willing to pay for it in the open market. That's how tokenization has been used so far. That is not really a financial product, and that's not participating in something called securitization, which is basically taking something real in the real world and turning it into a financial product. The real world asset trend is the next stage. The first stage of tokenization was uh, literally millions of cryptocurrencies, most of which have no value. The next step of tokenization is applying that same technology, but to real world assets. So you, again, like Larry Fink, have said that all credit, all commodities, all derivatives are going to be on chain. Why? Why do we need this? Why is this better than the system we currently have? Sure. So there's, there's kind of two fundamental reasons. The first fundamental reason is efficiency, is, uh, for example, something called atomic settlement or T plus zero or T zero. So the U.S. is going to T plus one 
which means it takes a certain amount of time for transactions to settle. When transactions take time to settle, like one, two, or three days, if it's a $100 billion transaction, we can't gain interest on that money. So I'm stuck in some transactional system where for a few days I don't get interest on the $100 billion that I, that I paid for something. And even a few days of four and a half, five and a half percent interest on $100 billion is a lot of money. That's a very basic example. That's an example around payments and partly collateral management. So the first thing is that people like, like Larry Fink are mired in all kinds of legacy problems that cost them literally hundreds of millions of dollars about how to rebalance their portfolios, about how to buy and sell assets, about how to receive payment, about how to prove things to people like the NAV, the, the valuation of the fund. These are esoteric middle office and back office problems, which the average person has no interest in because it's not their job, it's not their problem. But these problems are worth hundreds of billions in fees and complexity and risk. And, and that's one of the reasons people like him are so excited because if you're you know, a craftsman doing something and you had one tool and someone gave you a much better tool, you're excited about that. So that's one, one level of kind of why it's very important. And that's one of the big driving reasons why the DTCC, Clearstream, Euroclear, basically the three biggest uh, clearing and settlement systems in the world are, are now actively talking about transitioning to this model. The other side of it is market demand, right? So the ability to tokenize things has, has two really great properties to it. The first one is if you tokenize traditional assets, money market funds, treasuries, you, you basically put them on chain and then there's a market that wants to get them on chain because they can use them as collateral. So they can use them to back things on chain. And this is what people in the on chain world have been doing or trying to do for many years. They've been trying to create baskets of assets that are controlled in a private key based way. So traditional financial instruments are more attractive on chain because people want to own them on chain in a direct way where they control the asset just like they control a Bitcoin. Then there is net new assets. Net new assets are like tokenizing real estate for fractional ownership of a multi hundred million dollar building. Tokenizing private equity funds where you would have had to have five million to get in, now it can be at 10,000. Tokenizing carbon credits, tokenizing municipal bonds, tokenizing even gold that you can then go and redeem that gold in person against the cryptographically guaranteed token that you control, right? So then there's this whole category of net new assets that are not currently in the financial system, but once you tokenize them, tokenization is just a better, efficient, more efficient way to put them in the financial system. Right, so digital representation of ownership of an asset on chain, on the blockchain, and how big do you anticipate this market to be? Uh, hundreds of trillions. I, just take every market. Take the gold market, the real estate market, the debt market, the derivatives market, the securities lending market, all of these, all assets. What, what's fundamentally happening is you have a new, con you have a new format for assets, for, for ownership, and also for the data associated with that ownership. And the data is now appended to it in a way that proves things to you about the underlying assets. So the last time there was this type of transition, was in like the 60s and the 70s, where people transitioned from paper to basically databases. Right. That was the last time that value, all the world's value used to be on paper. And then databases appeared and computer systems appeared and the efficiencies and the benefits of computer systems and databases, even before the internet, right, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, were so vast and so great that all the world's value transitioned from paper into a database record. All the world's value. It wasn't some of the world's value. You don't have any piece of value right now that you own other than whatever you have in you know, your house somewhere that isn't in a database. But in the 60s and 70s, all of that value would have been in paper certificates or, or even other paper ledgers. So it's that type of transition where now we're going from databases, which you and me can't trust, right? So the, one of the fundamental differences is that you feel you have money in Silicon Valley Bank. And if you talk to people about Silicon, about their account in Silicon Valley Bank, right. you know, they're in the Valley, they're genius, tech entrepreneurs, the US financial system is, is, is wonderful. Two weeks before Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, it's like, you ask them, 
what degree of ownership and real control do you have over this asset that you have in this database? They will say complete control in Silicon Valley Bank. Two weeks after Silicon Valley Bank, you ask them, you know, what's your relationship with this asset? It's a, big, it's a great question. We don't know what our relationship is with this asset. But your relationship with a private key that you control and that private key's mathematically guaranteed control over an asset is very different. So does it bring ownership back to the individual yes. in a more concrete way? Yes. Because there have been some concerns about tokenizing everything and it infringing on on privacy. It's infringing on decentralization in a way. It's infringing on autonomy. I see you're laughing at that. Why, why is that comical? Why should people not be concerned about this trend of tokenization? Because the amount of centralization and control other people have over everything they own, and more importantly, the value, underlying value of everything they own, is extremely high. I would say that it's an all currently. Currently, yeah. So people are like, I have a brokerage account and I have a bank account. That's great. I control all this stuff. Yeah. Let's take a look at countries that have a bank default scenarios where they institute capital controls like Greece, where you can get more than I think, $65 a day, whether you were an individual or a business. And then take a look at the Bitcoin wallet registration numbers from that time period in Greece. And also take a look at the wallet registration numbers in what people thought were gonna be the next economies to fail, like Spain. So those wallet registration numbers go up like hundreds to thousands of percent because people realize that their relationship with their assets is a um, fiction. And it's a fiction that benefits people with a brand that have over 100 years with their brand. And their, their logic is, I have the legal system protecting you, I could, theoretically deny you access to your assets like Silicon Valley Bank did, but I won't because why would I? And then the, the situation changes like in Greece and capital controls are implemented or the situation changes and the solvency of the bank is in question because Moody's decides to do their job and you know clarify something even to a very small degree. And all of a sudden you can't access your life savings, right? So I think what, what has happened at this point is that brands and institutions are unbelievably expert at assuring everybody that they are safe and that it is safe to put your value and your assets in the system. What, what blockchains do, really another way to look at it is it creates what we call the verifiable web and that has three properties. The first property is that you can verify everything going on in the system. Well, actually no, the first property is you can verify how the system works before you join it. Then you can verify what's going on in the system at any one moment in time. So imagine if you knew every single piece of information that the CEO of your bank knew. Like you had access to exactly the same information. There was no delay between the solvency information of your bank and what you knew and what the CEO, that the CEO of the bank knew. So nothing could be hidden from, from you. That's the second property. And then the third property is that you can always choose to leave the system under the conditions you initially verified, right? And this is where private keys come in. So this is the new world we're kind of shifting towards. So Sergey, in a way, it takes some power and control away from the big players, from the institutions, and brings it back to the individual. Yes. So why are the big institutions pushing for this? It seems like it could be counter to their interests. It's, in it's inevitable, and if they don't participate, they will lose usership. So in, these, these are very smart people. Like the, the, the wages that people in banks and asset management get are on the high end of all wages. This attracts people for very, very smart. They're not dumb people. I interact with them on, on, sure that, on a yeah. daily basis. They're very clever, smart people. It, it's not like there's this huge monumental structural shift in how all value is managed and secured and transacted. And they're just gonna sit, and, and, and the numbers won't go from less than 100 billion to over two and a half trillion in the crypto industry. Right. And they're just gonna ignore it. Th this is just an inevitable reality because of the benefits of this technology. It's like, right now the internet is obvious to everybody, right? It's obvious that we communicate over the internet, we do Zoom calls, we send emails. 60s and 70s, you ask people about the internet, they're like, why would I need that? But the benefits are obvious now, right? right. 
So if you can't beat him, join him. And this is the trend that it's going. Okay, so you brought up the example of, of the internet and you brought up the example of, I guess, paper records, right? And there's always a winner and a loser in any major transformation, in any major evolution. Who are the losers? Who's going to be disadvantaged in terms of providers, in terms of institutions? Who are the players that are going to be on the other side of this when the tokenization trend really takes off? Right. The tokenization trend and the DeFi trend in the in the, like the the private chains of the banks. Right. Like you had, you know, like your publishers. Right. We still have some print stuff. Listen, I'm I'm old school. I like my hard copy. Right. But obviously, you had a lot of publishing businesses just to put on a very rudimentary level that got taken out of business, that lost out on this. Who are the losers as this trend really takes off? Yeah, so there's there's two groups. The, the first group is anything that can be packaged into a smart contract that some service or system charges a lot of money for. So if your financial service is doing some automated function that you do in, in your database and servers, and then you charge half a percent or a quarter of a percent in fees for that. And that can now be written in this technical agent. And this technical agent is so reliable that the chance of its failure is less than your system. And so nobody, like using your system is both more costly and more risky than this technical agent that's doing some calculation or some transfer or something. And there are parts of the financial services infrastructure that fall into that. And there are other parts that people think fall into that, but actually don't fall into that. And this is where a lot of people are confused about who will be displaced and that there will be, like everyone will be displaced. Everyone will not be displaced. There will be parts of people's financial services infrastructure offerings that are replaced by smart contracts. And there will be parts of what they do that will actually become more valuable in certain ways. How would a retail investor get exposure to the upside of this? Like what's what's the play here? I, I think generally speaking, uh, Bitcoin is, is, a, is a good uh, index for the whole crypto industry. And generally that's consistently continued to be the case. But for the tokenization industry, is it ETH? Is it Ethereum? Like how do you play play this trade for, to put it that way? I think that's very hard for me to say. I'm not exactly sure how people would approach that. Uh, I think they should have an interest in the real world assets themselves and think about adopting those real world assets like tokenized gold, tokenized uh, fractional ownership of real estate, tokenized carbon credits. That's, um, that's the direction I would think about. In terms of all the different technologies, I would kind of just look at the technology that's gonna become indispensable to allowing all of this to operate. Generally, my uh, experience and my reading of the history of technology is that the technologies that are critical for transactions to happen, for systems to move ahead, are, are the technologies that when those transactions increase, people are in a way forced to adopt those technologies because they, they have to adopt them in order to transact. 